welcome to Saving Europe. I'm the novelist Henry Viner Brooks, and I'm on the trail of two of history's unsung heroes. People who almost literally saved the Europe of their day. One is a 6th century Irish monk called Columbanus, and the other a 20th century statesman, Robert Schumann, who as it turns out would much rather have been a monk. Separated by a millennia and a half, for me they almost form the historical brackets of our European story, bookends of our cultural consciousness. You see, Columban was the first person to use the word European and to articulate the concept of a united Europe. And he was also an assertive immigrant, living in divisive and violent times, pleading for toleration. In the first part of this series, we chase him down on a 2,000 mile missionary odyssey across France, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and finally to a valley in northern Italy that Hemingway called the loveliest in the world. Through Europe's oldest cities, and along her vital waterways, in cathedral crypts and hermit's caves, over alpine passes and through vanished kingdoms, we'll meet not only modern Europeans, but we'll glimpse also their ancestors who survived the collapse of the Roman Empire and who gave their lives to preserve the lamp of learning, science and faith through the dark ages that followed. How those barbarians from beyond the borders became us Europeans is itself a story of epic proportions. But the forces and personalities that helped weld them together, I can assure you, is even more so. My family and I are taking a ferry to a land that was once beyond the borders of known civilization, Hibernia, the fabled land of winter. Indeed, it was a fearsome place of feuding warrior aristocracies, bloodthirsty gods, cruel servitude, and even human sacrifice. But by the 5th century, that was beginning to change. A countercultural revolution was underway. But this was not through the power of empire, for the Romans had never set foot in Hibernia. For one thing, they had enough problems of their own. Back home, I had seen the effects of this firsthand, as well as the possible location where the response from one teenage Romano Briton became not only Ireland's solution, but also, through Columbanus, the solution for Europe too. Let's face it, it isn't the first time that we've left the European Union. In fact, the last time, 1600 years ago, we were literally cut loose. The last words of Emperor Honorius to the beleaguered Britons was, look to your own defences. Well, I am at the last defences of the north where I live in Cumbria. This is the Hard Knot Fort. If you want to understand the beginning of the Dark Ages, you want to come here. Because on the northern frontier of the Roman Empire, this is where the Dark Ages actually began. It was here that the legions started to withdraw. And just as the lights were going out over Europe, a Romano-British teenager was being kidnapped and trafficked across these same seas into Hibernia. The West of Europe had never known anything as lasting as the Pax Romana. Consider for just a moment how extraordinary a thousand years of Roman rule had been. But in the final analysis, that was not enough to save them from the troubles that were coming. A stagnating economy for 200 years, and then the barbarians on the frontiers. But that doesn't mean that help wasn't at hand. And from somewhere like here, on the west coast of England, Patricius was kidnapped by pirates and taken to Ireland. Now, whether by some miracle of geography, and it probably was geography, 
the Irish had never been Romanized, but they had received not the Pax Romana, but the Pax Christi. They'd received the Christian religion. There was a young lad called Patricius who lived in a little town like this one, like Glanaventa. This could have been the one that Patricius was taken from. An ordinary 16-year-old kid, he was carted off to Ireland. There he said he knew want, nakedness and cold. He escaped after having a vision, but it changed him. Before that point, he'd had a very nominal faith. Now that's very interesting to uh, mention because he came back not despairing of a just God because he'd been abused. He came back with a red hot evangelical faith and he was determined to go back years later and take the gospel back to his captors, not just to offer them personal forgiveness, but to show the Irish the forgiveness of God, the Pax Christi, which turned out to be a much more lasting thing than even the Roman Empire had been. Patrick took the gospel and transformed the fabled Hibernian land of winters. And from there, from the last place that anybody would possibly have thought that help would come, from the Johnny-come-latelys to civilization, it is an extraordinary story. And that is why Columbanus matters. And that is why we're heading to Ireland to find out where he grew up, where he lived, where he got his training, and from where he left on his missionary odyssey that would take him a thousand miles south to a valley in northern Italy that Hemingway said was the loveliest in Europe. Now the subject of this documentary was born a hundred years after Patrick. He has been ranked alongside Charlemagne as the greatest man of the Middle Ages. Yet few today have heard of him. And those that think they have usually confuse him with his namesake, Columba of Iona. But Columbanus was part of that second generation of pioneers that came after Columba. He was born at a time when the fabled land of winter was enjoying its first spring. A profound renaissance in literacy, the arts, sciences and technology. That land of warriors and slave traders was becoming the island of saints and scholars that would be famous throughout Europe. Perhaps more dissenter than revolutionary, Columbanus has been called a new Moses, humanized by the face of a Saint Francis. He was a poet, a preacher, a prophet, polemicist, monastic pioneer, scholar and saint. His literary corpus alone places him head and shoulders above his contemporaries as the first great Irishman of letters. Columbanus was also the first Irishman ever to be the subject of biography. It was written very soon after his death by an Italian monk called Jonas, who traveled the length of Europe to get his material from eyewitnesses. Columban was born in the island of Ireland. This is situated in the extreme ocean and, according to common report, is charming, productive and free from wars which trouble other nations. Here lives the race of the Scotti, who, although they lack the laws of other nations, flourish in the doctrine of Christian strength and exceed in faith all the neighbouring tribes. Columban was born amid the beginnings of that race's faith in order that the religion which that race cherished uncompromisingly might be increased by his own fruitful toil. Jonas, Life of Columban. Columban was probably born somewhere between counties Meath and Carlo in the year 543. It was the very year that Benedict, that other formidable monastic founder, died in Italy. But these were also the dread years of a global pandemic that claimed maybe a hundred million lives. 
Perhaps half of the European population were wiped out. Even as the plague was arriving in Europe, one contemporary chronicler, who was himself the sole survivor in his family, reported that out of an entire city, there were only seven men and one ten-year-old boy who had survived. Doors hung open, he said. Valuables were left unprotected. Whole cities, like ghost towns. In Justinian's Constantinople, they were burying 10,000 a day. But that is not all. Research into polar ice cores by Harvard University suggests that this was literally the Annus Horribilis of human history, the worst period ever to have been alive. Because on top of the raging pandemic and the collapse of the Roman Empire, ice core samples show that in 536, a massive volcanic eruption in Iceland blotted out the sun in the northern hemisphere for 18 months, making the decade before Columban's birth the coldest in over 2,000 years. So he really was born into the darkest of dark ages. And if ever traumatized Europeans were looking for answers, it was in 543. Just before the birth of Columbanus, his mother had a dream. In it, a brilliant sun arose from her breast and illuminated the whole world. When he was born, she set about making it a reality. He was given the latest in education, grammar, rhetoric, geometry, as well as the Christian scriptures. And at first, all seemed to be going well. But as Columbanus entered those troublesome teenage years, his splendid colour, noble manliness, his formae elegantia, as Jonas calls it, attracted the attentions of the local girls. Whatever the particulars of the case, it brought this morally serious youth to a point of crisis. In a fit of despondency, he sought the advice of an old wise woman who lived in a nearby hermitage. And she told him to flee. Flee from the destruction which has ruined so many, she said. Turn from the road that leads to the gates of hell. Columbanus took the advice literally. Despite the protestations of his heartbroken mother, he left home straight away. And as far as we know, he never saw her again. Columbanus headed north to the island monastery of Cleanish on the River Urn, about three miles south of modern-day Enniskillen. We got special permission to camp on the island with Dr. Alex O'Hara, a scholar who has written several books about Columbanus and lectured extensively across Europe on him and the peoples of the post-Roman world. Sinol's monastery did not survive into the modern era. The current site is marked solely by a rectangular graveyard, a small number of unmarked gravestones and some architectural remains which date from the medieval period. The teenage Columbanus would have been met by Abbot Sinnel, and we too were greeted warmly by the local farmer on our arrival. With his lively wit and fatherly eye, I began to imagine that this farmer could well have been a venerable abbot himself in another age. Jonas never mentions Columbanus' father. Perhaps in an age when life expectancy was so low, he had already died. We will never know. But what we do know is that Columbanus was about to meet a man who assumed that most important role. Part father, part spiritual mentor, part academic tutor, Abbot Sinnel turned this headstrong and choleric youth into a methodical and a sturdy scholar. Jonas puts it like this. 
he betook himself to a holy man named Sinel, who at that time was distinguished among his countrymen for his unusual piety. And when the holy man saw that St. Columban had great ability, he instructed him in the knowledge of all the holy scriptures. Jonas, Life of Columban. And we returned to the graveyard to discuss what Columbanus had got himself into, and indeed what these monasteries represented to the people of their day. Wasn't it, I mean, a, a chief centre of biblical studies in the seventh century? Yeah, Ireland is the kind of Princeton or, or, or Yale of yeah. the seventh century. It's it's a hub for biblical scholarship, and it's a place where um, monks want to come to to deepen their formation and particularly their knowledge of, of sacred scripture. Yeah. So in terms of the the amount of big biblical commentaries that are produced in the early Middle Ages, um, Irish exegetes yeah. and exegesis um, account for most of the written biblical commentaries in the early medieval West. So Columbanus is coming here um, as a young man, probably around 15 to 20, early manhood. He's of the Eborca, so he's from a royal family in Leinster, yeah. in South Leinster, probably around the Carlo, Southern Carlo area around Mount, Mount Leinster. Yeah. And part of the formation for, for a young man is that you would be fostered in, in as a secular noble, you'd be sent to a high-ranking family. Yeah. But Columbanus was probably intended for the church. And so he comes here to Sinno, um, and he's seen as one of the great uh, scriptural scholars in Ireland at, at this time. Can we come back to the boy, the 14-year-old, maybe thereabouts, uh, arriving here? What might we have seen 1,400 years ago when Columbanus came here? Can you paint a picture of what kind of structures? Yeah, so it's it's this is a kind of a, a, a clearing, a clun inish. It's it's the, the uh, Clune is a kind of a meadow or a, or a clearing uh, on, on this island. And this island, it's situated between Upper and Lower Loch Urn. Mm -hmm. And so with a lot of these monastic sites like, like Clonmac Noise, they're on uh, nodal points. Yeah. Um, and so it's a highway. Um, Columbans has probably taken the River Barrow uh, up towards uh, Clonard in County Meath. Uh, before coming up here. So he's using the waterways, uh, the urn links to the Shannon. Um, and we're just above the river on, on a sloping hill. We're talking about a, a circular enclosure and archeologists have recently in the last few years identified some kind of enclosure, the vallum of the monastery. So monastic, the sacred space, was taken from secular sites in terms of ring forts, but they were given sacred meaning. Usually they were divided into three zones, uh, modeled on the temple in Jerusalem, so that the inner area of the monastery, so where, we're, where we are now, the graveyard, uh, this would be, have been the most ho the holiest really? place okay. beside the church. Yes. And this was only where professed monks were, were allowed to be. And there was, uh, another area outside and then the further area so pro progressive areas of sacred space so we're looking at a circular enclosure with the church and the graveyard in the center um, and with areas of agricultural activity uh, around. On, around what kind of education does he already have do you think by the time he comes here and then what is he getting yeah, so uh, Jonas talks about that he he had already received some schooling at, at home yeah What's um, interesting now in recent research is that we think he was from this dynasty, the Eborca. So if, if Columbanus comes from this royal lineage, um, he receives a, a good basic education at home before he leaves. Mm -hmm. um, but he's coming really he here in his late teens for uh, formation in, in scripture, but also um, possible that he he he, he studied mathematics, mm -hmm. uh, computus, the study of how um, do you calculate liturgical time, and the Irish are the the masters yes. of this at at, at, at this time. at this time. And when he goes to Bangor, um, 
it's possible that he became the the master of the school there. I mean, they felt um, that even the, the act of writing, copying, was a sacred. Hmm. Uh, was that different from other nations at the time? It's it's hard to say because in, in the sense that um, Ireland is part of the late antique world, so, and we're talking about a, a kind of patristic tradition that stretches from from Egypt mm. through Gaul yes. to, to Ireland. And Colin Bands is very much connected with, yes. with this world. Certainly there's a lot of that tradition is, is still still vibrant in, in Gaul at, at this time. Yeah. So we're, we're looking at, a, in a way, a common kind of pat late patristic tradition. But what's fascinating is that what we know is the codex or the book form is a Christian invention, yeah. um, that they developed the, the, the codex. Um, it's really the center of of Columbanus's life, it's the center of 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 the monastic community that, that that he's involved in. You're continually being informed by the word, studying the word. So it's really the the kind of um, the blood that's coursing through 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 these communities, and the way that that influences the understanding of literacy and of the book then as a sacred object and we can see that say with the book of kells yeah that the, that the way the word is is enshrined and is is revered really as a sacred uh, as a sacred mm -hmm. object uh saint benedict talks about in, in his rule about how the monks of egypt um they would pray the psalter mm. um the 150 psalms every day they would cover the the, the oh. entire psalter but that we're lazy and that this in the sixth century uh, that we at least will do it in a week in a week's time so <laughs> the 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 it was mandatory that you would cover the whole 150 psalms in one week now we know from columbanus's uh rules that the liturgical timetable was extremely uh rigid and mm. you're basically talking about a the divine office every three hours yeah. uh, throughout the day. So his formation here and, and later at at, uh, at Bangor would have been very intense. In terms of a, like a, a proto-university, he's writing his first work here or more than one. Yeah, Jonas mentions that he writes a commentary on the Psalms here, mm -hmm. which is sadly lost now. It may still be in some library in northern Italy or, a thought, isn't or it? Switzerland. Yeah. But he also mentions that he wrote hymns and poetry. Um, so this would have been part, and we know that. It was quite extraordinary and really quite moving for Alex and I, as we sat around the fire that evening with my younger children, to think that somewhere close to where we sat, in a humble wooden scriptorium, the young Colin Barnes produced those first literary works. It is an old adage that when the pupil is ready, the master arrives. And surely this had been true for Columbanus and Sinel. That abbot, renowned for his love of the Bible, had done his work well. Over 30 years later, at one of the darkest moments of his life, Columbanus would write a now famous letter. And even though it was written in great haste, he uses 29 quotations taken from 17 books of the Bible. That surely is a testament to the training he got here on the island of Klinish. But no time of training and preparation can last forever, and nor should it. When Colin Barnes was in his mid-twenties, news reached him from the east. On the shores of Belfast Lock, something unprecedented was happening in Ireland. Another monastery, indeed, a monastic city with an exploding population of thousands, was desperately in need of teachers. Columbanus was dispatched to his first academic post, one that would last him well into his mid-forties. And if you want to follow Columbanus on the next leg of his journey, indeed, if you want to know what it was like to live through the unprecedented cultural revolution sweeping 6th century Ireland, then join us next time on Saving Europe.
three things before you go. Firstly, thank you so much for watching. If you've got any questions or comments, please drop them below and I'll get back to you as best I can. Number two, join us again. Become a fellow traveler with us. Subscribe to the channel, hit the notifications key. Number three, and if you want to go faster, further, indeed deeper into this subject, then please purchase the Saving Europe book out now in all formats and at all good outlets. Just follow the links below. Thanks for watching.